welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. We all need a little help learning to create our own mnemonics and memory palaces. It can be difficult to apply a strategy that you previously used successfully to a new topic or new area of study. Luckily, we have a master of memory here to guide us, Timothy Moser. Author, Spanish instructor, and podcaster, Timothy has taught hundreds of people how to use memory palaces to learn new material. Timothy, it's great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Chase. It's good to be here. So, just a brief introduction here. I know you have a lot of material out there. You have several podcasts, books, et cetera. You teach courses. What got you into mnemonics and making these materials for others? Well, I've always been a hobbyist in memorization. I actually, when I was in high school, I learned some coding and I coded my own like quizzing software where I would just type things in. And it was very primitive. I would actually have to type it perfectly with no typos to see if I got it right. And it's always just been something I've done. But I only started applying mnemonics really systematically late in college. And after doing that, I kind of thought, hey, what if I just start a nice website where I kind of share how these techniques work? Because there was no good comprehensive place online at the time. And the URL masterofmemory.com was available. So I just reserved that and started a podcast and gained a following much faster than I expected. And it kind of evolved from there. Nice. It's a very important topic and getting to be more and more popular every year, it seems. And always looking for that sort of specific educational resource for a different topic. Because I know you cover poems and ancient texts and history and all kinds of things in your Master of Memory show. And I assume there's a lot of different techniques you need to use for different types of topics. Yeah, the techniques themselves, I I think about them a lot. I try them with my students and I try to figure out not just how to memorize material, but also how to make it so that the information when you retrieve it is actually usable in a practical way. So for example, with poetry, as you mentioned, I don't find it practical actually, as some numinists do, to memorize every single word of a poem Instead, I create the mnemonics for one or two keywords per line in the poem and then say the poem a few times and it all sticks together much more quickly and organically. Gotcha. And I know we're going to cover a couple of examples later in the show. So that'll be great to give some of the audience like hands-on experience, cover some Spanish examples since that is one of your other podcasts and courses that you teach, and then also going into some anatomy. So specifically for medical mnemonics, which can be difficult to find at times. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, Anatomy might be the subject where the most memorization is needed in the shortest period of time. So I haven't studied it in depth myself, but I'm happy to apply my knowledge to it and learn it myself as well. Awesome. I can't wait to see what we come up with. Are there any specific approaches that you would say might vary, such as I know in a previous conversation you and I had with discipline-based material versus systems-based or integrated material. Are there any techniques that you might be able to explain a little better for those, or is it really subject-specific, I guess? Yeah, I find it to be pretty subject-specific, as you say, and I think that it's interesting trying to separate the two where a lot of disciplines involve something that's much more connected or a crossover between the two. I mean, language has always been a good example of that because You can memorize vocabulary systematically in a linear fashion. You could, like, for example, memorize a dictionary of a language and still not be able to put a sentence together. So trying to figure out the kind of neural network of how these things interplay is really where I've spent the most time, kind of on the the common ground between them. Okay. So when it comes to organizing some of the material... Do you recommend using mind maps for your memory palaces? I know some people recommend using it after you've created the memory palace. Some people say you can put a mind map within your palace. I'm just kind of curious to get your take on that. Yeah, I actually love mind maps um, and specifically structuring memory palaces around those mind maps. So for example, uh, with the mind map, you have central topic, branch topics, and then subtopics within those branches. If you're using house or something as a memory palace, 
you can turn those branch topics into rooms, the subtopics within those into pieces of furniture within those rooms, and then divide your items of information from there inside each of those pieces of furniture. And so that's how I tend to structure my palaces. Okay. So I guess we should just dive in and sort of give some examples of of what you've come up with. I know the first one we're going to cover is your Spanish example. So how are we going to set this up? Yeah, so the, the mind map idea is actually a great way to start thinking about it. When you have a language, obviously you have to learn vocabulary and phrases. There's a whole lot of information. There's the grammar and everything. What we found to be the most effective way to organize a memory palace is simply to divide the vocabulary into topics uh, or specifically into the categories of parts of speech. So you'll have one whole palace for prepositions, another for conjunctions, another one for pronouns, and so on. And then from there, you subdivide that memory palace into the the, uh, grammatical functions or the types of pronouns that they are. For example, direct object pronouns, indirect object. And that actually becomes a very easy way not only to learn the words, but also to learn the grammar and how they're used in a sentence. Because if you can use one indirect object, you can use all of them because they're all in that same place. So that explains how to sort the memory palace, but how to memorize the words and what they actually mean is going to be much more complicated. And that's something we can talk about if you like, just the way that the words themselves can be turned into their meanings. Sure. Uh, Does it have anything to do with sort of like a rehearsal or space repetition? That seems to be a common theme in, in a lot of memory type trainings. Yeah, absolutely. Spaced repetition is a great way to keep remembering it. Actually, what's interesting is that for the top, say, 500 words of a language, that's about where the cutoff is, you'll find that spaced repetition actually is kind of almost irrelevant because you're going to use those 500 words in every conversation. You know, little connectors like the or an or it, you can't really avoid reviewing those. So the spaced repetition, I think, becomes more important a bit later. But even with these tiny little words where they're going to become second nature very quickly, I do recommend starting with mnemonics in your memory palace that tie the word to its meaning. I could actually dive into an example with our own memory palace and a few words from one of our word categories. We have one of the areas of the memory palace, of course, is reserved for adverbs and adverbs are really fun and versatile because you can basically use them, uh, a lot of adverbs, pretty much anywhere in a sentence. So if you're learning, you know, the word for already or the word for later or the word for well, you can just throw that into a sentence for the most part and it's easy to use. And all adverbs in the same category will be used the same way, pretty much. Okay. So, hmm. I'm trying to think of some of the Spanish podcasts of yours that I I listened to in the past. Unfortunately, it's been a while now, so I'm having trouble remembering. But uh, some of the themes that you used in the past were different characters that were brought back up. I think a bee was one of them. There's uh, one theme at at an amusement park or something along those lines. Do you find that using these recurrent themes really helped to solidify some of the information as well? Yeah. So the the reason for that partly is just because it makes it more distinct and memorable to have the different scenes be just completely different. An amusement park, a plaza, of um, a, like a marketplace plaza, shops, and a home. Because a lot of our students don't really know a whole lot of grammar. And so if you just, if you tell them preposition, they, will, they won't have any idea what you're talking about. But if you say a word from the amusement park, then they know exactly what you're talking about. And all they have to remember is that those words are prepositions or conjunctions. Ah, okay. I can see how that could be useful. Well, I think everyone probably has trouble with grammar to some degree. I know it's a a big problem of mine. Is this something that we're going to be able to reuse in a medical study sense as well? Yeah, I think so. Because when you think about, for example, learning anatomy, You're learning different categories, but in an organic way as well. So, for example, you can learn the skeletal system or the cardiovascular system, but the fact is that they're all joined together organically. And the dilemma tends to be you can either learn systems 
or you can go by area in the body, or you have to do some sort of combination of both. And for me, that's very much like learning a language. You can either learn vocabulary or you can learn phrases and practice with entire phrases, which you have to do if you're going to speak a language. Or you can take an approach that organizes it in such a way that you can do both and interchange your vocabulary in an intelligent way uh, because it's organized in the memory palace is organized by parts of speech in that sense. So that's how I would approach anatomy as well is sort your memory palace by systems. So, you know, using that mind map, you have the different systems of the body, but within those systems, within those rooms in the memory palace, you keep, for example, all of the terms you need to learn from the skeletal system organized in terms of how the body is organized. Like one end could be the head and one end could be the feet. And you just learn uh, mnemonics for all of the terms you need to learn, each different bone or whatever, in locations that are intelligently placed throughout that palace. Okay. So in a way, it's like a, a homunculus for your learning. Homunculus is like a visual depiction that sometimes used in neurology for what part of the brain is attached to what movement of what part of the body, like hands, feet, etc. And it, it's kind of laid out that way. I guess you'd have to visualize it. I probably shouldn't have thrown that in there randomly. But. <laughs> no, that's, that's cool. I, I like that idea. So, yeah, yeah. But the dilemma that you'll come to when you do this, of course, is now you've divorced every system from ev every other system. And they obviously work together so closely, like the muscular and skeletal system or lymphatic and uh, cardiovascular, that you really can't keep them separate like that. So you have to, um, just like with language, you can review your vocabulary in its palace, but you also have to review it in phrases and speak it out loud. So with anatomy at the same time, you can review each of those terms from those systems, one system at a time, but then you also need to use diagrams and put the systems together visually so you can see how they all interplay in each area of the body. Okay. I, I can see how this would be, well, there's a big debate in medical education right now as far as discipline-based versus integrative education system. So like a discipline-based or subject-based would be you learn anatomy separately, you learn physiology separately, you learn microbiology separately. And that's been the traditional method for teaching at least the first two years of med school. So now some schools anyway are trying to do more of an integrated. And I guess this would be similar to learning the vocabulary versus learning sentences in a way. Yeah, that's how, I, that's how I really see it. I mean, the idea of that being a debate makes sense from a creating the curriculum standpoint. But as far as personal learners go, people who just want to sit down and learn the stuff, I don't see it as that much of a problem because you can, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can memorize tons of facts early in the day, and then later in the day, review them in how they interplay with one another. Okay. How could we go about doing that? Do you have any ideas for maybe uh, tips or tricks for the audience to actually implement both strategies? Yeah. So I would definitely divide your time pretty evenly between memorizing words and organically seeing like visually how it works in the body. So that's actually, that really should be as close to 50-50 as possible. And that's what I tell my students for uh, Spanish as well. They should spend half their time on their vocabulary and half their time on speaking phrases because you can't neglect one or the other. But with the way that words are acquired in particular, if you want to be able to use the words that you're learning for, for anatomy or whatever, you want to be thinking about how they're pronounced and what the object is. So let's say that you're working on the area of the upper arm and shoulder. And so you have each of the different systems of the body in different areas of the palace, but in each of those different rooms, each of those different systems, you're specifically looking at your area that pertains to the upper arm and the shoulder. One of the words you'll encounter is the deltoid, which abducts the arm or moves it forward. And for me, that's a, it's simple to create a mnemonic for that. I just imagine a river that's branching out like a delta. And in the river, in a particular place in my memory palace, this, um, this river-shaped muscle has an arm 
that's been taken away from somebody and is moving forward. So the deltoid abducts the arm, removes it away from the sagittal plane, and moves it forward. So that's my mnemonic for deltoid. But the main thing here is that I've used the stressed syllable of the word. I'm not saying deltoid. I'm not mispronouncing it. I'm using deltoid and emphasizing that part of the word. And at the same time, I can jump to the corresponding place in my skeletal memory palace and learn scapula or clavicle according to um, mnemonics based on how those words are pronounced as well. So it sounds like a bit of language training can be very useful for creating stronger mnemonics. I think so. And for me, I mean, everything is language when it comes down to terminology, like words are words. And it's one thing to be able to write words, and it's another to be able to speak about them intelligently, I think. Okay, very true. What about when you have several that are very similar in names, as you probably found in some of your research, you can have a nerve, a vein, and a muscle, and sometimes even a bone that all have a similar name because they're in a similar area of the body. So for anatomy anyway, how would you distinguish between those with your visuals? Yeah, great question. So with these, if the pronunciation is very, very similar, especially the stressed part of the word, which is the like 90% of the word is the stressed syllable of the word, you could actually use the same image, the same object mnemonic in three different rooms in your memory palace. So with language, we've had to do this a lot. There's, um, there are words that have the same stressed syllable in many, many different words. For example, the syllable yen comes up a ton in Spanish. There are so many words that sound the same because they have yen in them. For example, bien, tambien, um, many, many others that sound similar, but they're, they're just used very, very differently. And what we've done is we've taken an image of Japanese yen and put that in different places in the palace. So what happens is you have similar sounding words, but since they're in different places, you never confuse them because just like you would never confuse, let's just imagine you have a pillowcase and a cloth napkin. The cloth napkin in your kitchen is never going to be confused with your pillowcase because they're in two completely different places with different functions. Okay, gotcha. So if you have a nerve and a vein or artery that have the same name, you would just place them differently, place them in a different location for... Uh... Yeah, one in, the, one in the nervous system and one in the cardiovascular system. And then, um, of, of course, it's important to pronounce them out loud a few times and practice them in their locations. But really, having them in those separate places makes them very, very different in our minds since we are spatial creatures. Yeah, I, actually, now recalling back uh, many years ago when I took anatomy, the first time going through that, you are basically learning a whole other language. Well, you are in microbiology as well. That's a different language. Pharmacology is a different language. So a lot of these language-based skill sets can really help for making medical mnemonics, I feel. Yeah, I, I think I see that as well. And that's what, uh, that's what excites me about diving into this a bit more on my own as well. I think uh, we can have some fun making some course material and other podcasts in the future do little short segments for everyone when they get stuck on certain topics and, and material. Yeah, that'd be fun. I've actually, I've had people ask me on my show about learning anatomy and they would ask about particular terms and so on. And I had a lot of fun creating some of the sample mnemonics for that. So here is a sort of a personal question for this type of material. I find that it's sometimes more difficult to go back and add a mnemonic to material you've already learned. So for me to go back and start creating all these new mnemonics for the basic sciences, the first two years of med school, has been a bit of a challenge because I've already converted it into, I guess, a different part of my memory at that point. Have you run into that with your other training? Yeah, for sure. That's, that's been a big theme, actually. So for example, a lot of people, when they first pick up the, the book of Accelerated Spanish, they get frustrated because all the words that I'm teaching are words that they've already learned previously. And they wonder why we have to learn these mnemonics and put them in a memory palace when we've already learned them before and they know how to use them. But then a few lessons later, they're extremely grateful for the extra work that they did, for the work that they put in to put those things in locations because you're not just learning the words. So for example, if you know what the humorous is already, why put that in the memory palace? The reason is that you're 
not learning the word, but you're learning how to integrate it in your comprehensive system for anatomy. So instead of thinking of it as like relearning something, you're just thinking about it in a new way such that it will relate organically with everything else that you're learning in a systematic way. All right. Yeah, I've run into a lot of roadblocks that way. I'm like, do I really want to put the extra effort into learning this again? Is it going to benefit me to create all these mnemonics and to, you know, recall them, rehearse them, space repetition to make them last if, if I already have it in a different part of my memory, if it's already solidified to some degree, or if it's something I'm never going to use again because the test is already gone. So <laughs> a lot of that stuff you never use again. Yeah. And I mean, you definitely do have to make a judgment call on that. Um, for language, it's always worth it because, for example, if you already know how to use one direct object, all you have to do is choose a place in a memory palace for that and then learn all of your new direct objects in that same place. And thanks to your existing knowledge and it's um, marrying it with your new knowledge, you now know how to use all of those new words accurately. Huh. All right. So as we start getting closer to the end of this interview, are there any particular resources that you would recommend for medical students, any your resources, outside resources, anything like that? Well, as far as mnemonics go and just getting to know kind of how the language that you and I speak in terms of using memory palaces and stress syllable mnemonics for me is a big one. I would just recommend using the starter guide at masterofmemory.com. It's a free guide. You don't have to put your email in or anything. You can just browse it online. And it kind of shows you my own methods that I found extremely useful for learning vocabulary quickly, learning names and numbers and, and so on, and integrating them into organized memory palaces using, as you mentioned, the idea of kind of a branch system or a mind map system to structure the palace. All right. Yeah, I noticed there's a, a big difference in those that are just being introduced to the methods versus those that have a little experience and sort of what resources they find useful too. So it's good to see what has worked for you as someone with a lot of experience in multiple topics of, of memory training. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. I can have certain conversations with people who have done some things, but for those who email me and say, hey, how would I do this? I have to give them some sort of common ground with me. So I'm not just speaking a different language. So the masterofmemory.com starter guide is a good place to start. Awesome. I am starting a new segment as of this episode, not to throw new stuff at you in particular, but I used to do a walk down memory lane and I decided to switch up the questions a little bit just to give a little personal insight into the guests that I have on the show. So I got three new questions for you if you'd be all right to kind of start off this pilot episode? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I'm an experimenter. <laughs> Great. All right. First question. If there's one thing you could change about your own memory, what would it be? Hmm. That's tough because human memory is such... A, like, it, it'd be easy for me just to say, I wish I had a permanent photographic memory. Yeah, that would but be nice. I don't, I don't know if I would want that because the, the human mind is so brilliant in the way that it knows how to prioritize memories. You know, I wish I could actually just tell my brain which things are important and which things aren't. So I don't get a stupid song from an exercise tape I heard when I was a kid stuck in my head for a week like I did recently. I'd, I'd rather forget that, actually. So I wish I could itemize things in my memory and tell my brain which ones to recall more often and which ones are irrelevant. Okay, that's fair. I like that. Yeah, too many uh, commercials and jingles stuck in my memory exactly. as well. <laughs> Question number two, if there's one thing that you could change about education, and this is a broad topic, so the education system in general or your own education system, whatever you would like, what would that be? I think the number one purpose of education is to teach children or teach people how to learn. Because there's no, um, and we're finding this more and more, there's just no canon of the stuff you need to know to live a successful life in this world. The only thing you really need is like even like talk to any anybody in any profession, uh, engineers, whatever. They learned what they learned on the job. They didn't learn it in school. And so the most important skills are teaching people how to learn. For example, you can you could teach anatomy like this, but there's going to be so much more that you have to learn in your professional life. And so if instead of just teaching anatomy, we taught students 
how to learn anatomy and anything else, then they'd be ready for the real world. I like it. Yeah, I like teaching students how to learn first off and also sort of along those topics, competency-based educations, I feel are becoming more useful. So you're not stuck on material that might not be the most important for your future path. You just get by what you need to get by. All right. For question number three, if there's one thing you could change in medicine, what would it be? Hmm. Since I'm outside of the medical field, this one's tough for me. It is. Uh, Personally, um, but I I actually, I have some opinions on this. Uh, So uh, this takes me back, but when I was in college, I uh, kind of destroyed my hands practicing piano too much. I, I decided I wanted to be better and I pounded out scales for two hours a day. And that's not good for your, for your fingers. So I gave myself permanent tendonitis in my little fingers on both hands. And the different doctors that we saw, just it, they were all specialists in different things. There was one in sports medicine and basically said, hey, here's some cortisol, deal with the pain. Literally just said, I think you're just going to have to um, play through the pain. And every musician that I talked to said, no, you don't play through pain. You, you manage it. And yeah, so uh, long story short, I wish that there were people, uh, personally, I wish that they were um, specialists in medical, uh, let's say, musical medicine or medicine for musicians specifically. We have to do things repetitively with our fingers. And it's just not something that as we found, that that really is very commonly addressed. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I usually hear a lot about the super subspecialized types of medicine and kind of why we really need to get more into teams, not individual physicians treating people. Actually, there's a good Netflix video right now on the Mayo Clinic about that, but Hmm. I I didn't really think about it specifically for medical or for musical training. So that's uh, an interesting point. I don't believe there is a, a medical specialist just for piano player or pianist yeah, fingers. We, we went among many doctors and there was just nobody who really knew what to, it was very clear. Even they said they didn't know. This is just not that uh, common an issue for them. Wow. Okay. Well, are there any parting words for the audience? I would say just keep learning and growing. Like no matter what field you go into, if you decide to get out of medicine or get out of whatever you happen to be doing or jump into, into studying medicine, Remember that the most important skill is just, I think, personal growth and always learning new things. You can see this as good news, but you'll never stop learning new things. You're not going to memorize that anatomy book and then be done. You're always going to learn new things in your life. And as long as you can see that as a good and beautiful thing, then I think you'll have a great attitude toward life. I love it. That's a great answer. Well, Timothy Moser, Master of Memory, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really hope to have you back. Maybe we can work out a few more skits for, uh, for specific disciplines and body parts and the audience will get a lot from it. Yeah, let's do that, Chase. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Take care. 